Turn in your Bibles this morning to Leviticus. Once again today, Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4. We're going to be working our way through this chapter and the first part of chapter 5 and pulling in some other sections of Leviticus too before our, our time runs out this morning. But we're going to begin by reading the first 12 verses. Those are the words that we're going to put up on the screen for you to follow along with. Leviticus chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Here's what it says. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done and does any one of them, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the head of the bull and kill the bull before the Lord. And the anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull and bring it into the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle part of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord that is in the tent of meeting, and all the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all the fat of the bull of the sin offering he shall remove from it, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidney, just as these are taken from the ox of the sacrifice of the peace offerings." And the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. But the skin of the bull and all of its flesh, with its head, its legs, its entrails, its dung, all the rest of the bull, he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place, to the ash heap, and shall burn it up on a fire of wood. On the ash heap it shall be burned up. This is the word of the Lord. Will you join me in praying for the illumination of God's spirit as we continue to look at this? Father, we, we ask that your spirit now would do his work in our hearts. Help us to see the cleansing that you have provided for your people, ultimately through your son, Jesus. For it's in his name that we ask it. Amen. Like many uh, kids, uh, boys at least, I, I grew up not taking hand washing terribly seriously. It was one of those things that you had to do because your mom made you do it before you ate dinner or something like that. Uh, it was during a trip to India in my early 20s that uh, the importance of hand washing was brought home the first time. You know, concerns about the germs that, that I, as uh, somebody from the Western world, might encounter in a third world country. Um, not the stuff that you can get inoculated against, but just the normal bugs, which to, a, to an Indian person wouldn't have been any worse than an average cold, but to me would have been, uh, would have been harder. Uh, that was the danger that we were trying to protect against. And so our guides would tell us, you have to wash your hands. You can't just use the hand sanitizer. You have to wash your hands with soap and water real thoroughly, and then you use the hand sanitizer. You can't sanitize dirt, they would say. And so, and so uh, that, that importance of, of washing was, was brought home. And then, of course, all of us, a few years ago, were, were, were inaugurated once again into the importance of hand washing with COVID and the germs that were circulating because of that. And we all got uh, tutorials on the right way and the proper amount of time to spend washing hands and using hand sanitizer. The Jewish people also over the years since the Torah was written, developed traditions of hand washings. They took washings very seriously. So that by the time you get to Jesus in the Gospels, they had developed a, a whole culture of washing that was in addition to uh, the laws that are contained in, in the Mosaic Law. Washing, cleanliness is more important than we realize, isn't it? And the reality is that the more we dig into the situation that we are in spiritually, the more we realize just how bad it is. Our uncleanness is much worse than we realized. But the good news is that our cleansing is much more effective than we could ever imagine. That's what I want to bring home to you this morning as we continue to look at the offering system, the sacrificial system of Israel. What I think we see conveyed to us in this fourth offering, what's called the sin offering, is this truth. That while our uncleanness is much worse than we realized, our cleansing is much more effective 
than we could ever imagine. We've talked about three offerings uh, so far in this series. We've talked about the burnt offering. Remember that, the, where the, the animal is offered in its entirety, is burnt up in its entirety, with, with, uh, with the exception being the skin, the hide of the animal in the burnt offering. That was given to the priest from, as, as a way of providing livelihood for him and for his family. But the rest of the animal was burnt up, and we talked about how that was a picture of total devotion to the Lord. We talked about how those burnt offerings were being offered continually on the altar of burnt offering. Then we talked about the grain offering. If you remember, they could bring uh, raw grain or baked bread, and, and a memorial portion was taken out, a handful of grain was taken out and burnt on the altar of burnt offering, and the rest of it we talked about being given to the priests. That was one of the ways that God provided for the priesthood in ancient Israel. And then last week, we talked about what's called the peace offering or the fellowship offering, where just one part of the animal, the slaughtered animal, is taken out, the fat and, and some of the, the, um, uh, the, the organs, the liver and the kidneys and things like that are taken out and burned up on the altar of burnt offering. And then the, the, the chest of the animal, the breast of the animal, and the right thigh is given to the priest, and the rest of the animal is butchered and cooked and eaten by the worshiper and his family and friends. It was the initiation of a great celebratory feast. This morning, we are looking at this fourth offering, what's called the sin offering, and it's worth noting right here at the outset that, that it's helpful when you think about the sin offering, when you read about the sin offering, to realize that Leviticus and the rest of the Torah makes a distinction between ceremonial uncleanness and sinfulness. That's something that we don't spend much time thinking about, but you could be ceremonially unclean in ancient Israel and not be sinful. Right? Now, if you are sinful, you were ceremonially unclean, and that needed to be dealt with. But there were all kinds of ways that you could become unclean that had nothing to do with sin and so when we talk about the sin offering, what we have to realize is that this is an offering that is meant to purify, to cleanse from uncleanness. It is not meant all by itself to atone for sin. That's an important distinction to keep in mind. So another way of thinking about this is that if an Israelite sinned, they would become ceremonially unclean, and then the process for, for getting right with God would involve a sin offering, but that was more for the purpose of purifying their ceremonially, ceremonial uncleanness and less about dealing with the sin itself. The offering which has sin most clearly in view is the offering that we're going to look at next week, what's called the guilt offering. And so that's an important distinction to keep in mind. You could call the sin offering the purification offering in that sense. In fact, some commentators refer to it that way. That's not a good translation of Leviticus 4 and 5, but it's a good way of understanding it. So, so many commentators will call it the sin offering for purification or just the purification offering. That's what's being done here with the sin offering, and we're going to see that as we go forward through this passage. Our uncleanness is worse than we realized. But our cleansing, our purification, is also much more effective than we ever imagined. So in order to make that point, I have four statements that I want to demonstrate coming out of this passage. Number one is that our uncleanness is more extensive than we know. Number two, our purification is more costly than we realize. Number three, our purity is more urgent than we understand. And then the good news, number four, our cleansing is more complete than we ever could have hoped. So that's where we're going this morning. Our uncleanness is much worse than we realized, but our cleansing is more effective than we imagined. So first of all, consider how deep our uncleanness goes. Our uncleanness is more extensive than we know. Leviticus chapter 4 offers four scenarios of uncleanness that the sin offering was meant to address. The first is the one that we read at the opening of our sermon time this morning. It had to do with what happens when the high priest sins. And if you notice, uh, the, the, the specifications there are pretty clear. If a high priest sins, then he has to bring a bull. There's no, there's no options of different animals that could be brought. It was just a bull. That was the only possibility. A bull was brought and slaughtered. And then the blood is caught and manipulated in certain ways that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and then the entirety of the bull, after the blood is taken and, and dealt with, and after the organs are taken out and burned on the altar of burnt offering, as is the case with the peace offering, the entire bull, the rest of it, is then taken outside the camp and burned in its entirety. And that's what verses 11 and 12 say. It shall carry it outside the camp to a clean place, to the ash heap, and shall burn it up on the fire of wood. So that's what to do when the high priest sins. The rest of the chapter goes on and lists three other scenarios 
which kind of cover the whole gamut of what happens if Israel sins. Verses 13 through 21 talk about what happens if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally. And it comes to their knowledge. They also, in that situation, a bull then is going to be brought. And, and in fact, uh, it looks very much the same as it does in the case of the high priest sinning. A bull is slaughtered. The blood is taken inside the tabernacle, sprinkled seven times in front of the curtain that separated the holy of holies from the holy place. Blood is dabbed on the horns of the incense altar. By the way, do you know what it means when it talks about the horns of the incense altar? We hear the word horns, and we imagine the horns of a bull or the horns of an animal. What it's talking about, of course, with the incense altar and then later with the horns of the altar of burnt offering, all it's talking about is that you know, here is a rectangular piece of furniture that has a rim, and the corners, the four corners of those rims are are, are raised, they're stylized. You, you know, can you picture a coffee table or an end table that has a rim and the corners are kind of raised up into points? Those are the horns of the altar. So in the case of the incense altar inside the tabernacle, the blood after it's sprinkled seven times in front of the curtain is then dabbed on those four corners of the altar of incense. Okay? Then everything else looks pretty much the same too with, with the case of the whole congregation being sinful. Then you get to verse 22, and, and you see something slightly different. Look at verse 22 of chapter 4. When a leader sins, a leader, a ruler sins, doing unintentionally any one of the things that by the commandments of the Lord his God ought not to be done, and realizes his guilt, or the sin which he has committed is made no dim, he shall bring as his offering a goat. Okay, so not a bull this time, but a goat, a male without blemish, and he shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord it is a sin offering. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. Okay, so slightly different, but similar to what happens uh, in the other two cases. And then the rest of it is poured out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. Verse 26, and all of its fat he shall burn on the altar like the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And so the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin and he shall be forgiven. So here you have a similar situation, a goat instead of a bull. But the, the, the blood is still manipulated in that way. Some of it's dabbed on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. And then the, the fat parts, the, 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 the organ meat is taken out and burned on the altar of burnt offering with the burnt offering. But then as we're going to see, something else gets done with the rest of the goat. And then in verse 27, we have the fourth possible scenario. This covers everybody else, right? If any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and realizes his guilt, then it goes on and, and, and it says what needs to be done in that case. In this case, it's a, a female goat that is brought. But, it, but the rest of the process looks just like what's done in the case of the leader who sins. And then you get down to verse 32, and we see another option being presented. Instead of a female goat, the, the individual could bring a female lamb. And then you have the peace offering portions that are taken out and burnt on the altar, burnt offering, uh, just uh, as is the case uh, with the leader who sins. Okay. So here's the, here are the specifications, right? All of the specifications for how the sin offering was to be conducted. There are some other considerations here too. In chapter five, we read that there are, just like in some of the other offerings, there are gradations for affordability in the sin offering. So if you glance ahead to chapter five, verse seven, it says, if the person cannot afford a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed to turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, right? So just as in other offerings, if they can't afford one thing, here's something less costly that can be brought. And then similarly in verse 11 of chapter 5, it says, if he cannot afford two turtle doves or two pigeons, then he shall bring as his offering for the sin that he has committed a tenth of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. And then it goes through the specifications for that. But we understand that, that what God is doing is simply saying, look, I, my, my goal here is not to beggar my people. I don't want things to be so costly that you can't afford it. I want my people to know that if they have sinned in some way, if they have become unclean and they need to be purified, there is something within their price range that they can do to make this happen. And there's one other major consideration about this sin offering that I want to lay out to you right here as we get started this morning because it becomes important later on. And to see this, I want you to jump ahead to chapter 6. Look at Leviticus chapter 6, verse 24 and following. Here we're going to see what happens to the goat 
or the lamb that is brought in the case of a leader or a commoner bringing a sin offering. It's different than what happened when the high priest or the whole congregation sinned. When the high priest or the whole congregation was guilty of sin, they brought a bull, and all of it, with a few exceptions, gets taken outside the camp and burnt up. But in the case of an individual, whether it's a leader or a commoner, here's what happens. Look at Leviticus 6, verse 24. The Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten, in the court of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches its flesh shall be holy. And when any of its blood is splashed on a garment, you shall wash that on which it was splashed in a holy place. And the earthenware vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken. But if it is boiled in a bronze vessel, that shall be scoured and rinsed in water. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It is most holy. But no sin offering shall be eaten from which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place. It shall be burned up with fire. So understand what's happening. We have these four scenarios. The high priest or the whole congregation sinning on the one hand, or an individual, either a ruler or a commoner sinning on the other. And in the case of the high priest or the whole congregation, when that bull for the sin offering is killed and the blood is taken into the holy place, that bull now cannot be eaten. It needs to be taken outside the camp and burned. But in the case of the individual, the goat or the lamb that is brought as the sin offering, there the blood is put on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and the parts are taken out and burnt on the altar of burnt offering, but the rest of the animal is eaten by the priests. This isn't an optional thing either. You notice in verse 27, 26, it says, the priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. Now, I want you to file that piece of information away and save it. We're going to bring that up again later. What I want to point out to you here under this first point, that our uncleanness is more extensive than we know, is that even unintentional sins are a cause for disfellowship with God and need to be remedied. I don't know if you picked up on that as we were reading through chapter 4, but in each case, each of the four scenarios that are presented, it is emphasized if someone sins unintentionally, or the King James says, if they sin and they are in ignorance about it. Now, we hear that and we go, well, if, if I didn't know, then it doesn't count, right? My ignorance should absolve me. But God says, no, that's not how it works. You see, friends, what, what Israel is being taught and what we are being taught is that our uncleanness goes deeper than we know. It, it affects everything, even the, things, even the ways that we sin in ignorance. Our uncleanness is more extensive than we know. Not only that, but we learn that our uncleanness is catching. Our uncleanness is contagious. The blood that is sprinkled in front of the uh, veil in the temple or that is dabbed on the horns of the altar of incense within the tabernacle or that is dabbed on the horns of the altar of burnt offering outside the tabernacle. Commentators are, 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 are unanimous in the fact that this is meant to be a picture of repurification. That's why they did that. That's why the blood was carried into the holy place and sprinkled and dabbed. It was a way of purifying, of consecrating or re-consecrating those articles of furniture in the tabernacle. Uh, this fact is made very clear once you get into chapter 8 and you see Moses and Aaron consecrating all the articles of the temple. It says explicitly that he dabbed the, the blood on those things and so consecrated them. So the question then becomes, well, why is it necessary to re-consecrate the articles of furniture in the tabernacle? Why is it necessary to consecrate the altar of, of uh, burnt offering? Why is it necessary to re-consecrate the incense altar? Why is it necessary to re-consecrate the whole tabernacle by sprinkling the blood seven times in front of the veil? Those are inanimate objects. They didn't sin. They didn't do anything wrong any more than the slaughtered animals did anything wrong. So why is that necessary? The answer is that the uncleanness of God's people affects their environment. The uncleanness of the priest, the uncleanness of the nation, the uncleanness of the individual, it impacts the articles of worship. It impacts the tabernacle. The people, through their uncleanness, make their place unclean. Our uncleanness is catching. Do you see? We shouldn't be surprised at this, 
because we've seen this truth conveyed to us all through Scripture up until this point. In fact, we saw it first conveyed to us in Genesis, right? In Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve fall into sin, and God says to them, Cursed is the ground because of you. Well, that doesn't make sense. What, what did the ground do? What did the earth do? But God says, no, you don't understand. Your connection to your place is deeper than you know. And when you fall, it falls. When you are under a curse, it is under a curse. And he's saying the same thing to Israel here. When you are unclean, everything else is unclean too. And so in order to reestablish purity, it's not just you, the sinner, who needs to be purified. It's the whole place, the altar, the tabernacle. Everything needs to be repurified. Our uncleanness is catching. I think there's some important implications of this, by the way, for us as we think about the world that we live in. You know, we have debates about our environment, our climate. We talk about climate change and carbon footprints and, and, and carbon dioxide and all, the, all these things, greenhouse gases. We talk about these things and we wonder to what extent does our actions as humans affect our environment? And listen, I'm not a climate scientist. I don't know the answer to those questions. But as a student of the Bible, I can say there is a direct line between what's wrong with our world and what's wrong with us. Our world is broken because we are broken. Right? That seems pretty clear. We can talk about this also in terms of how we think about people and how they're raised. You know, sometimes in our, in our culture, we want to say that people are sinful or, or people are immoral or they're, they're, they're mentally malformed or something because their environment was bad. If we can just get the environment right, if, they, if we can make sure kids are taught the right things, if we can make sure they read the right books, if we can make sure they have the right influences as kids, in other words, if we can get the environment right, then the result will be good people when they grow up. And the Bible says, no, the relationship is precisely backwards. The environment is bad because people are bad. You can't change the environment and hope that the people will get better. You have to change the people. Our hearts have to be changed. Our uncleanness runs deeper than we know. Our uncleanness is more extensive than we know. But the good news then is that our purification... Um, well, this isn't the good news yet, but the second point is our, our purification is more costly than we realize. As we look through the, the, the law of the sin offering, we realize that the, the sin offering or the purification offering, uh, it looks like a combination of the burnt offering and the peace offering in some ways, doesn't it? Parts of the animal are taken out and burnt on the altar of burnt offering, just as was the case with the peace offering. The animal was slaughtered by the responsible or the representative party. The blood was sprinkled or dabbed, as we've just talked about. And in the case of the priest or the whole congregation, the rest of the carcass of that bull that was slaughtered is taken outside the camp of Israel, outside uh, the, the borders of their camp, and is burned. And then, as we saw in the case of the leader or other individual, the rest of the carcass was eaten by the priest. So those are the two options of what happens to the animal. Either it's taken outside the camp and burned, or it's eaten by the priests, right? Are we, are we clear on that? Now, I want you to think about what that image is supposed to convey to the Israelites. The picture, I think, in the case of the sin of the individual, whether the leader or the commoner, the, the picture of the priest eating the goat or the lamb of the sin offering is clearly meant to be symbolic of the transfer of uncleanness from the worshiper to the priest. This seems very clear because of what happens when the animal is first brought. Remember, when the animal is first brought and the, and the worshiper who's bringing the animal, the person who wants to reestablish cleanliness, he puts his hand on the head of the animal and he confesses the reason that he's bringing it. He's saying, I'm bringing this for purification. I'm bringing this because of a sin. I'm bringing this because of some uncleanness that I've contracted. And then the animal is slaughtered, and it's clear that the animal at that point is seen as symbolically taking away the uncleanness of the person bringing the animal. But then, when the worshiper who brought the animal watches as that animal is then cooked and eaten by the priest, the imagery is clear, isn't it? Now the priest is taking upon himself, symbolically, the uncleanness of the person who brought the animal. The fact that this is the imagery that's meant to be conveyed here is made very clear when you get to Leviticus chapter 10. I'm not going to go there right now. We don't have time. 
But I encourage you, if you want to see this in more detail, you can look at Leviticus chapter 10 later, the story of Nadab and Abihu, and, and what this sin offering, how the sin offering is handled after their death. And one of the things that you see there is Moses rebuking Aaron for not eating the sin offering like he was supposed to do. And he says, this was for the atonement of Israel. So that's the picture, right? In the case of the, of the leader or the commoner who sins, the picture is of the priest taking upon himself the uncleanness of the, of the offending party. The picture in the case of the sin of the high priest or the entire congregation is of the uncleanness being borne entirely by the animal. And only a bull would do for this. And that's why the bull, after it's slaughtered, is then taken outside the camp and burned in its entirety. Everything is burned. God makes it very clear about that. Yes, there's still a portion taken out and, and burnt on the altar, burnt offering. But then the rest of it, including the skin, by the way, which is different now. This makes it different than the burnt offering. And it's taken outside the camp, which is a symbol of uncleanness. The whole point is the bull now has taken upon itself the uncleanness of the priest or the uncleanness of the nation. And it goes outside the camp and is destroyed and entirely burnt up and done away with. And so symbolically, the uncleanness is taken away and done away with. All of which is simply meant to convey to Israel and to us that the cost of reestablishing cleanliness, the cost of purification is high. Someone has to take it. Some substitute has to be found. Either the priest takes it upon himself, symbolically, or the bull takes it upon itself, symbolically, but it doesn't just go away. That's the point. You can't just wish it away. It has to be dealt with somehow. Someone or something has to bear it away. Our purification is more costly than we realize. But also, our purity is more urgent than we understand. See, it's at this point that, that we look at this and go, what, what is the big deal? Why do we need this purity anyway? I mean, we, we talk about purity in our culture, and it's probably more often associated with, with boring ideas and, and, and things than anything else. So we, we go, why, why do we need this purity? Why is there such an emphasis on purity or, or purification here? Our purity is more urgent than we understand. For the Israelites, you must remember, the purity wasn't just about a ritual or a religious duty. Their purity, their cleanliness before God was the ground of their relationship with God. Remember, Leviticus is given to answer the problem of separation. Leviticus, we, we said at the beginning of the series, answers the problem of separation. When we finished Exodus, we saw Moses outside the tabernacle. That was a new state for Moses. Moses was used to going inside the tent of meeting and speaking to God face to face, as it were, as a man speaks to his friend. But by the time we get to Exodus chapter 40 and the glory of God comes down on the tabernacle, he couldn't get inside the tabernacle because of the glory of God. And Leviticus picks up right where that left off. We see God speaking to Moses from the tabernacle. Moses still isn't inside the tabernacle. And that's a problem. That's a problem for Israel because it's symbolic of the fact that God and Israel are separated. But God had promised all along that he would dwell with them. Right? This was God's promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob all along, I will be with you, I will guard you, I will go with you, I will protect you. He had promised to them all along, I will be your God and you will be my people. I will dwell among you and be your God. This is so much the identity of God's people that they were the people among whom God dwells. They were the people who had fellowship with God that's so much part of the identity of God's people that when God says to Moses in the aftermath of the incident with the golden calf, when God says to Moses, I will fulfill my promise, I will take the people into the promised land, I will drive out their enemies before them, I will give them the land of promise, but I won't dwell with you. Moses says, no deal. We're not doing it that way. <laughs> Moses has the audacity to say to God, if you're not going to go with us, we're not going. 
they wouldn't accept the promises of God. They wouldn't accept the blessings of God without God himself. This is such an important lesson for us, isn't it? Friends, if God ever says to you, if God ever says to you, I will give you heaven. I will give you eternal life. I will take away the diseases that rack your bodies here on this earth. I will wipe away the tears from your eyes. I will reunite you with those who have gone on before you. I'll give you everything that you ever dreamed of in heaven, but I won't be there. You grab God and say, no. He's not going to make that offer. Just <laughs> God's place without God is worthless. So this is a problem. The fact that Israel is impure, the fact that there's a separation between God and his people, that's why this is a problem. <coughs> Our purity is more urgent than we realize. It has to be dealt with. The centrality of Israel's purity, I think, is put on display best in <coughs> Leviticus chapter 9. And I want you to turn there with me for just a minute. Turn forward to Leviticus chapter 9. In Leviticus 8 and 9, we see Moses and Aaron implementing all of the offerings, purifying everything, getting everything ready for the ongoing worship of Israel. Okay? So then we get into Leviticus chapter 9, and we read these words. I'm going to read a long section here from Leviticus 9. So follow along. Don't fall asleep. If you have to, you can stand up and walk around, but I want you to get this, okay? You understand why I read these long passages of Scripture, right? It's because even if I make some dumb comments in my sermon, you will at least benefit from hearing the Word of Almighty God. So this is, this is good for you to hear the Word of God. Listen, Leviticus chapter 9, starting at verse 8. Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. So sin offering, right? We're talking about what we've just been reading about. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver from the sin offering he burned on the altar, as the Lord commanded Moses, and the flesh and the skin he burned up with fire outside the camp. All right, so just like we read the specifications earlier in chapter 4, yeah? Then he killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar, and they handed the burnt offerings to him piece by piece, and the head, and he burned them on the altar, and he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with burnt offerings on the altar. Again, this is the implementation of what we've been talking about the past few weeks, yes? Yes. Verse 15, then he presented the people's offering and took the goat to the sin offering that was for the people and killed it and offered it as a sin offering like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the rule. And he presented the grain offering and took a handful of it and burned it on the altar beside the burnt offering of the morning. Then he killed the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings for the people. And Aaron's sons handed him the blood and he threw it against the sides of the altar. But the fat pieces of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail and that which covers the entrails and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver. They put the fat pieces on the breasts and he burned the fat pieces on the altar, but the breasts and the right thigh Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Then, verse 22, Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. You see, God, Moses and Aaron are doing everything that God commanded. And you notice that the sin offering is the basis for the burnt offering and the grain offering and the peace offering. Purification has to be made first. Cleanliness has to be established first. And then everything, including the, the peace offering, which instituted the, the fellowship feast that the people were going to enjoy afterwards. And then look what happens. Verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Let me suggest to you that Leviticus 9.23 is the focal point of this entire book. And to the extent that Leviticus is the focal point of the entire Pentateuch, I think it's fair to say that Leviticus 9.23 is the center point for the entire five books of Moses. Because here you see reestablished the communication, the relationship between God and his people that was broken. 
that was shown to be broken at the end of Exodus and the beginning of Leviticus. Moses wasn't able to go into the tent of meeting to be with God, but now purification has been made, and now he can go back into the tent. Now he can behold God again. Now the relationship is reestablished. Purification has been made. He is clean. And the glory of the Lord is seen. Verse 24, And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their face. They're worshiping, right? God's people are worshiping. Do you want to worship? Do you want to have an experience of God's glory that drives you to your face, not in anger or despair, but in glory? If you want that, you have to be pure. Our purity is much more urgent than we realize. Our uncleanness is worse than we realize, but our cleansing is much more effective than we could ever imagine. So, to recap, to recap, we are all, by nature, more unclean than we realize. Our uncleanness is so great that even the things that we don't do in actual rebellion against God are still unclean. All those unintentionals of chapter 4, right? Or as Isaiah said, uh, even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before the Lord. I, I heard a, a quotation this week at our, at our conference that we went to. Uh, from, it was attributed to the Puritans. It was something I had never heard before, but it went something like this. Even our tears of repentance have to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And it's true. Even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. We're more unclean than we realize. Our uncleanness is so great that it makes everything around us unclean by association. And the cost of removing this uncleanness is nothing less than someone or something to carry the burden of it in our place. And we absolutely need this to happen if we are to have any hope of finding satisfaction in this life. Of finding satisfaction in our relationship with God. We need it. So, what hope is there? And this is our fourth point this morning. Our cleansing is more complete than we could have hoped. Because it's just here that the gospel steps in and says that our purification has been completed. This cleansing that we so desperately need has been accomplished for us through Jesus Christ. So listen to the words of the New Testament authors. The sin offering are two of the most common references for Jesus in the New Testament. When the New Testament authors thought about how the Old Testament typified Jesus and foreshadowed his coming, they talked about the burnt offering and this, the sin offering, more often than anything else. So listen. Listen to these words. First of all, from Hebrews 13, verses 11 and 12. Here's what it says. The bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin... You see what he's talking about? He's talking about the sin offering that we just read about. They're burned outside the camp, right? The bull taken outside the camp and burned. But then what does he say? So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify. That is to say, in order to cleanse, purify the people through his own blood. You see, Hebrews is saying that even the place where Jesus was crucified is significant. The fact that Jesus was crucified on a mountain outside Jerusalem is a reference to this fact that the bull of the sin offering was taken outside the camp. The implication clearly being that Jesus took our uncleanness on himself. Yeah? Or consider Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21 who says of Jesus very clearly, God for our sake made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was made unclean in order to accomplish our cleansing. Or again, in Hebrews 9, we read these words. When every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels in worship. He's talking about this purification rite. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified by these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. 
For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Friends, we have been cleansed. The blood of Jesus suffices to cleanse his people. Hebrews is telling us that everything in the law, all of the sin offerings that were offered by the high priest for himself and for the nation and for individuals, all of it pointed to this. All of that sufficed to do nothing but purify the pictures of the heavenly things. But Jesus' blood suffices to do the job perfectly. Now we hear all that and we say, okay, we are now cleansed, we are now pure, but what about the sins that I still commit? I still commit sins, so how do I deal with that? But brother and sister, let me ask you, how many of your sins were still future at the moment when Jesus made purification through his death on the cross? All of them. They were all still future. So you can look with assurance at the sins that you will still commit later today and tomorrow and a year from now and say, all of it has been cleansed. I am clean from all of it because Christ, the final sin offering, has been sacrificed. Purification has been made. Or think about it this way. Think about what Jesus says to Peter. Do you remember the story of Jesus speaking to Peter in John 13 after or while he's, clean, while he's cleansing them, while he's washing their feet? Remember the story? And Peter says, no, Lord, don't wash my feet. I'm not worthy to have you wash my feet. You'll never wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. <laughs> Cleansing, right? But then Peter says, well, in that case, don't wash just my feet. Wash all of me, which I love, right? Peter wants all of Jesus. He wants more. That's a right response. But Jesus says, you don't need that. The person who wants to be clean has only to wash his feet, and he will be clean. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? This is every boy's favorite verse, right? I only need to wash my feet, and I'm clean. <laughs> you understand, Jesus is saying nothing about that. He's saying, all you need is what I give you. What I give you is sufficient. You need nothing else. The one who I make clean is clean indeed. Don't think you need anything else. We have no need of any cleansing except what Jesus has already provided. His work is done. You are clean. Brother and sister, you are pure in the sight of God. This is why Paul speaks as he does in Colossians 3. He says, you have been raised up with Christ, so seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, you also will be revealed with him in glory. Do you understand the glory of that verse? What Paul is saying is that the true you is not who you are now, it's who you are in God's sight in eternity. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Never be discouraged, brother and sister, when you look at your sinfulness and see your uncleanness. That is not what God sees. He sees your true self. And one day that will be revealed to you, too. Or this is why John says in 1 John 3, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, purifies himself, even as he is pure. We are clean in the sight of God. But you notice, even in all of that, even as Jesus washes Peter's feet and he says, I have made you clean, he says, and yet not, not all of you. And John tells us that when Jesus says not all of you are clean, he was speaking of Judas who would betray him. 
And so even as we, as we talk about this glor- glorious truth that we are clean in Christ, we realize that there are those who are not clean. And so my friend, if you're listening to this and you realize that, that you are not clean, you realize that you don't belong to Jesus, then my, my admonition to you is to repent and accept the cleansing that Jesus offers. And then it will be said truly of you also, you are clean in God's sight. So don't let that be true of you. You ask, how do I know I'm clean? How can I know that I am clean? The answer is simple. Is Jesus your king? Have you bowed your knee to Jesus? Do you trust the word of Jesus above the words of your family or friends or your culture, your teachers, your coworkers, your own heart? Do you hate the uncleanness of your sin? Do you long to be free of it? Do you long for Jesus to return so that you can, like the Israelites in Leviticus 9, behold his glory and shout for joy and fall on your face before him? If those things are true of you, then you're clean and you can rest in that. Or do you find yourself listening more to your own heart than you do to Jesus? Do you value the opinion of friends and coworkers and family more than what God says about you? Then maybe you're not clean. Do you cherish your pet sins, the sins that you love, even though God says they are filth? Then perhaps you are not clean. Do you feel nothing at the thought of the return of Jesus? Friend, maybe this is one of the sincerest ways that we can tell where we are spiritually. When you think of the return of Jesus, do you feel nothing? Do you feel apathy? Or worse, do you, do you fear the return of Jesus because it will mean the end of the life that you enjoy so much as it is now? Or do you look forward to it with the white-hot enjoyment of God's presence forever? This helps us know whether we are clean or whether we are unclean. But if you are unclean, know that your cleansing waits. Repent and trust. Our uncleanness is much worse than we realized. But our cleansing in Christ is much more effective than we could ever imagine. Take a moment in silent thought and prayer as you think about this. Give thanks to God for the cleansing that he has accomplished for you in Jesus. Give yourself to him and experience his cleansing in perfection. And in just a moment, we'll conclude by singing together once more.